Hello and welcome to the latest CSF podcast on actual spongular arthritis. We'll be bringing you new episodes on a bi-monthly basis alongside our psoriatic arthritis podcasts. And we'll also be supplying you with monthly slide decks to help keep you up to date with the latest research and publications in the field of actual spongular arthritis. First of all, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Professor Hideto Kameda, Professor of Internal Medicine at Toho University in Japan. My main areas of expertise being in targeted therapy for rheumatic diseases, including spongular arthritis. With me today is Professor Xenophon Balariakos, Professor of Internal Medicine and Rheumatology at the Lu University in Bochum, and a Senior Consultant and Scientific Coordinator of the Rheumatology Center, Rheumacentrum, Liu Gebbeit in Herum, Germany. We are also joined by Dr. Sofia Lamiro, consultant rheumatologist and senior researcher at Zuderland Medical Center and Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands, as well as a together professor of medicine and medical director of rheumatology clinics in the Division of Arthritis and Rheumatic Diseases at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, USA. And of course, if you want to find out more about us and the papers we discussed today, please head over to the CSF website, www.sitekindsignaling.com. Now, Sophia, over to you. Thank you very much, Hideto. Start our first paper evaluated the 52-week efficacy and safety uh, of opadacitinib in the SELECT ACCESS 2 study in patients with radiographic actual SPA and who had an inadequate response to biological DMARDs. And our second paper then goes on to describe via a narrative review the safety and efficacy of opadacitinib in actual SPA. So over to you, Xenophon. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia. Um, our first paper, um, as mentioned, is titled Fecacy and Safety of Upadacitinib in Patients with Ankylosing Spondylitis, Refractory to Biologic Therapy. Um, and uh, one here results from the uh, open label extension of a phase three study. For the study background, um, the treatment with biologic DMARD, we need to be aware of, uh, such as a TNF blocker or an IL-17 inhibitor is recommended in patients with radiographic axial spondylarthritis or ankylosing spondylitis. However, many patients do not receive adequate response with uh, their first biologic DMARD. The uh, 2022 Azazula recommendations recommend the use of a JAK inhibitor for patients with intolerance or inadequate response to NSAIDs. They recommend switching to another biologic DMARD or a JAK inhibitor for those with an inadequate response to their first biologic DMARD. Now, for uparacitinib, it's a JAK inhibitor that has demonstrated efficacy and an acceptable safety profile in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. And this um, paper that we're discussing here reports the 52-week safety and efficacy um, of uparacitinib uh, in patients with ankylosing spondylitis who had inadequate responses to the biologic DMARDs that I discussed before. This means what we would be doing also in uh, according to the recommendations. For the results, um, improvements were seen with upadacitinib at week 14, um, and they were sustained over 52 weeks. There were positive responses seen in ASAS-40, as does uh, low disease activity, and as does inactive disease statuses. Improvements were observed not only in disease activity, but also in pain, in function, in enthesitis, and quality of life um, outcomes. And the response was comparable in patients who continued uparacitinib and those who switched from placebo uh, to uparacitinib at week 14, which in fact shows that this was indeed a drug effect. So for the conclusions, uparacitinib um, is an effective and well-tolerated treatment for ankylosing spondylitis patients who um, have inadequately responded to biologic DMARDs. The positive response rates were maintained over one year, which is of course important for the sustainability of the drug and the safety profile remained as expected. 
this overall um, is something that we certainly need to take into account in daily practice, can discuss with our peers um, that we are seeing also in daily practice in those patients who we switch from a biologic DMAR to a, um, a targeted synthetic DMAR. And I'm really happy to know what the other colleagues on the panel have to say about that. Maybe I can start, Xenophon. Uh, thank you very much. I think this is indeed, uh, these are important results. And I, I think what we can underline uh, is that the, the imp in the importance of them, that when we have a drug with a new indication, commonly what happens is that we tend to start it in patients that have previously failed other drugs. So it's particularly important when we have a new drug to know whether it works in patients that have failed previous uh, treatment, so in this case with biological DMART. So I think this adds an important piece of information to uh, the data we have from upadacitinib to know that also in those patients, previously biologics, we see a response and that response is uh, sustained. Um, I think maybe we can, what we can discuss is questions that I think we often get uh, from people is, how do we place the different uh, modes of actions uh, in terms of how do we prioritize them? So it, does this type of study help us to prioritize um, the, the drugs according to, to the treatment uh, algorithm? What, what do you think about that? Well, maybe I can say something before the others say, uh, comment on your question. And I would also say that I would add to that, that the evidence we get out of such data is whether the drug indeed also hits other modes of action for having this activity. So it's not that just the efficacy, it's a question, do we have now a different drug or is it just one more of the same uh, kind? And I think here we see the data, they, we, we do hit also other targets when it comes to this activity, but I'm happy to know what the others say, of course. No, I, I got a couple of... Um points to make. Number one is, I mean, many of us have been involved from the very beginning of the upa program in Axial SPA. And <clears throat> this study was started, uh, this is a phase three study, specifically to look at biologic DMARD experienced or inadequate responder patient. And at that time, <clears throat> the company, we did not know what kind of uh, label they are going to get in the US. And it is so fortuitous for them because by that time, that oral surveillance study was not out in the US. And it was a stroke of luck that they decided to do a phase three study specifically to look at patients who are biologic demand inadequate responder. Now, in the US, and I'm curious to know what the situation is in Japan and in Europe, um, but here we cannot use JAK inhibitors unless, well, cannot use, of course we use, but then the at least the label says, do not use it unless anti-TNF have failed, and this is for any disease, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, actually SPA. If I order it, the insurance company will say, no, no, the patient has to fail, we are not going to approve this, et cetera. So this is very interesting. So this is the population in which this drug will be used in the US, and that's the biggest market for the drug company. And I'm just uh, looking back, they were so lucky, well, I don't know, they were smart, they were lucky, but they did this study specifically in this. So that's the first point which I wanted to make. And, and the second point is, of course, uh, people, they always ask, well, what happened to MACE events and what about cardiovascular events? And as far as I rem remember, uh, um, you know, from, there were none of them in, in this particular study for one year. We also looked at the uh, the other JAK inhibitor, uh, um, which is tofacitinib. We looked into their phase two and phase three study and the entire program of tofacitinib, there were no such, uh, there were no MACE events at all. And of course, these patients were younger compared to the patients in uh, in the oral surveillance study, different disease, et cetera, et cetera. But that always stays in the back of our mind. So this study and the other study on two JAK inhibitors, there were no um, study, uh, there, there were no MACE events. So those were the two important points I wanted to make. I, I fully agree with that, Atul. Um, we, the positive, Thing about or they say the, the good thing for the study is, which is something that still gives us question marks, um, is the uh, follow-up long enough to really see those events? Right. Uh, well, I would say yes and no, if, well, it's one here, 
Uh, on the other hand, maybe yes, because we need more years to really accumulate any any kind of um, such events. On the other hand, as you mentioned, this is a totally different population than in the oral surveillance study that we may even never reach in spondyloarthritis studies. Of course, these patients will get older, they will get comorbidities and so on, but we want, we want to prevent those comorbidities by acting early enough. So I have to say that I'm very confident for the use of JAK inhibitors in spondyloarthritis, uh, simply because we de we have to deal with completely different patients. What, what do you have this bad black box warning in Europe or no? You can use it's it. It's not the same. We can use it, but where we have uh, risk factors, so uh, there are uh, risk factors that have been identified. So age uh, above sixty five, a previous atherosclerotic event of patients that have risk factors for cardiovascular disease or malignancy. In those, we should should be careful and in principle we should only use if other drugs have failed but other patients in not in these risk groups actually if we look i was going to add that if we look at oral surveillance if we look at the younger group we don't see a high in, an increased risk of uh, cardiovascular events either so it's mainly in those three groups that i just mentioned that we see meaning that in terms of age it's above 65 and a population with a cardiovascular risk factor in oral surveillance. So it's not surprising that in our population where patients are mostly beyond uh, below 65, of course, and without major risk factors that we, we are not seeing that. So I agree with all your saying that I think we are not seeing signs uh, for that. On the other hand, I think we have to, to, to admit that we are not competing with oral surveillance in terms of the study design that is the perfect study that has been designed ever. I, I, I usually say that uh, uh, tofacitinib has been extremely well investigated in terms of safety, has had a specific set, set, set up trial to investigate safety on a comparative uh, way, which has not been done for other drugs. Uh, and, and therefore, we cannot fully exclude an, until we would see a, a trial. But I think we are going to see that trial. And I think the data accumulated is uh, giving us a uh, more confidence, especially in the younger group and with less comorbidity. So I totally agree with you. Yes, I also agree with you. So the positioning of JAK inhibitor or especially uparacetin may be different between ankylosing spondylitis or actual spa versus rheumatoid arthritis. So it is a very important point. Thank you. Yeah, so in, in Japan, you don't have any restrictions. You can use it before TNF inhibitors, can you? Yes. So yeah. just that I, I, think, I think that is very sensible, and I agree with Sophia and um, also with Xenophon that uh, this, in a way, shows us that the population was younger. So that uh, above 65 and risk factors were not there. And so, again, it shows that probably in this population, it is pretty safe to use. Uh, um, yeah, the, uh, and I, I take your point, Xenophon, this is not long enough, but at least there is not a, no signal, which is also a good thing. I mean, at least you see some minor signal here and there. And so um, sure, and sure, sure. time will tell, of course, when you follow this patient for a longer period of time. Yeah, long-term data and also observational data. Now, if in Japan and as well as other countries, that they're being more widely prescribed as a first line, then if we start getting accumulated data from registries and observational studies, then we will learn more about the long-term uh, adverse events of the uh, profile of these drugs. Yes. All right. So uh, we are staying on the same theme of upadacitinib in excess spondyloarthritis. So the second paper is titled The Role of Upadacitinib for the Treatment of Excess Spondyloarthritis. And this is a review article. Um, it was a narrative review. So the background of this uh, paper is that Janus kinase inhibitors are approved for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and now more recently for excess spondyloarthritis. And the authors conducted a narrative review of relevant human studies published in English language from 2018 to 2022. And the search was performed on PubMed using specific keywords related to upadacitinib and axial spondyloarthritis. The initial search uh, identified 44 publications meeting the inclusion criteria. And after excluding duplicates, ineligible studies uh, and discussion, a total of eight studies were selected for the inclusion of this narrative review. And what the authors found 
was that in select axis one and two, significant improve, uh, significantly more patients in the Upada Shetanet group, 52% and 45% respectively, and select axis one and two, achieved ASS 40 response than the placebo group, uh, which is 26% and 23% respectively. And in select PSA1, a higher ACR20 rates uh, were observed with 15 milligram and 30 milligram upadacitinib than with placebo. Now, 15 milligram is the dose that is approved all over the world. This particular study did look at the double dose. And the efficacy was superior to adalimumab in the 30 milligram dose, which is not approved for the treatment of PSA, but not the 15 milligram dose. In select PSA2, treatment with upadacitinib 15 milligram and upadacitinib 30 milligram resulted in superior efficacy ACR20 compared with placebo as well. So the randomized control trials of upadacitinib in psoriatic arthritis and axial SPA showed a very similar safety profile. So the conclusion of the authors after doing this narrative review is that based on the reviewed studies, upadacitinib demonstrated efficacy in improving symptoms and disease activity in patients with excess spondylar arthritis. And the results were consistent with those observed in psoriatic arthritis, highlighting the potential use of upadacitinib as a treatment option for axial SPA. Select axis one and select axis two found upadacitinib had superior efficacy compared with placebo. Efficacy was maintained in long-term extension studies and safety outcomes were generally similar between trials for RA, PSA, and Excel SPA. So <clears throat> this is not a single study. This is just a accumulating evidence, which is what we were discussing earlier, that the more comfortable we get with the more uh, accumulated evidence from such a review of published literature, but then also post-marketing surveillance and our own practices, then only we will know really what the safety of uh, these agents, jack inhibitors, uh, the safety is in uh, spondyloarthritis. Comments? So currently no head-to-head -head analysis is available in spondyloarthritis. Well, so there, there is that one study where there is adlimumab versus um, that was. Interestingly, they added adlimumab as a active comparator. Nobody mm -hmm. does a study thinking that we are going to compare head-to-head. -head. They added mm -hmm. that as a active comparator, and they had this 30 milligram dose, which is a uh, 30 milligram dose, by the way, is available in the US to treat inflammatory bowel disease. Mm. And it is, and I have one patient who is on that dose for, you know, started by gastroenterologist. And it is, it really is a spectacular, a spectacular dose, I should say, well, N of one, but it does uh, have much higher efficacy and, um, so in uh, to answer to your quick question, Hideto, that single study is this, uh, it, it happened to be, and, and, and then they showed, they were able to show some superiority. Mm -hmm. uh, in psoriatic arthritis. <clears throat> yes. In Japan, yes, we can use 30 milligram for allergic dermatitis, or oh, is that right? uh, 25 for inter, um, remission induction for IBD. 45? 45 for injection wow. of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis yeah. for eight weeks or 12 weeks initially. And you're not seeing more adverse events? Yeah, no. So no. it also no, I mean, depends on the population. So patients with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease are very young. Young. And the most adverse events is non-control of IBD. That's yeah. the most severe adverse events. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I always uh, tell my patients and uh, also uh, to others that uh, we are always worried about the side effect of the drug, which of course is important, but then side effect of the disease in the situation that Hideto you mentioned, uncontrolled severe inflammatory bowel mm -hmm. disease, patients might need colectomy or horrendous yes. things that might happen to them. <clears throat> Those are real. And then you really have to take the chance and you have to treat them aggressively with this very, very high dose of uh, JAK inhibitor. Another, another interesting, and I'm sorry, uh, Sophia, you, you actually had a point. I'll, I'll wait for you to finish your point. I, I was only going to say that uh, I, I agree with what you said, uh, so I don't want to add much on that. But to add to what uh, 
Ideto was uh, talking about there being no head-to-head -head studies, and this aligns with a comment I was making first to Xenophon about this type of studies helping us positioning the drugs. On the one hand, it's true what you mentioned, of course, there's an active comparator with adalimumab. On the other hand, it's not really, uh, it's not powered to compare, it's not a head-to-head -head study. And it's quite disappointing that at this time we are still uh, performing basically placebo controlled trials only and not mostly head to head trials, which are the most informative for us, for our daily clinical practice and for our patients. So I, I think and hope that in the future we will have together with eventually placebo controlled studies, which I can perfectly understand their value. I think it would be good to also have more head to head studies and to try to have the sponsors engaging into, into although I understand the challenges. Well, one, maybe one comment from my side. Sorry, I was cut out a bit. Um, <clears throat> we also need to remember what happened in the past uh, with the, and I told you know it even better than all of us, the 52-week placebo control studies. You remember that, right? Uh, even that was, for many, many patients, I wouldn't even call it unethical, but really impossible to, to really convince them to, to go in there. And the value of these this head-to-head trials is extremely important. It doesn't always have to be negative in the case of something that really is negative in terms of efficacy because you always buy a bit of efficacy on the cost of safety or vice versa. Yeah. So I agree with uh, with the comments made before. We need to try to conduct more of those studies. They are extremely informative and they may help us also in the, diagnose, in the therapeutic algorithm. Yeah, a couple of points. Number one is that the head quit studies a company will not do unless they are sure they're not going to fail. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the things sometimes they do is they do non-inferiority as their primary endpoint, and then superiority becomes their secondary point, endpoint. So they don't really fail one way or the other. And uh, psoriatic arthritis field is clearly ahead of us, ahead of us, ahead of axial SPA field, I should say, in that they have done a couple of uh, IL-17 inhibitors, both lixagizumab and secukinumab versus adlimumab, head-to-head studies. And of course, they can, can craftily choose the primary endpoint and uh, the way it was done with the lixagizumab. Um, it was smartly done rather than crafty, is not the word. But, um, and, and then there, is, there are these studies, and of course, there is the study uh, that Xenophon presented uh, before, um, the SURPASS study, which was the only head-to-head -head study in axial spinal arthritis. So the, the, these studies will come. I think I think it just takes time um, for, um, and, and even if you look at the rheumatoid arthritis literature, initially they just want to get their drug out and they just want to have, you know, get it approved before embarking on this kind of uh, more slightly risky situations. But I think that will basically come sooner. The other quick point I wanted to make was <clears throat> I'm always amazed with JAK inhibitors because we don't exactly know what all cytokines they are being uh, are being suppressed. This probably is our combination therapy because this also point comes up all the time. Combination therapy. We should do combination therapy and we burnt our hands with uh, in rheumatoid arthritis with the combination of TNF inhibitor plus IL-1 uh, interleukin 1 inhibitor first and then TNF inhibitor plus abetacept and both the times the safety was kind of problematic and now we are again resurrecting this idea with there is a study going on of busulcomab and golimumab for psoriatic arthritis etc but look at jack inhibitor I mean this is combination therapy <clears throat> I mean if you think about it using prednisone is combination therapy using methotrexate is a combination therapy because we don't know what all cytokines these are kind of dirty drugs in a way that they block multiple cytokines at the same time. And that's one of the reasons why JAK inhibitors have been so successful in blocking multiple cytokines. We don't exactly know which are direct, I mean, we know which are the directly ones, direct inhibition with JAK inhibitors. But then there are downstream indirect inhibitors. And that is the interesting part I always think about when I look at these studies as to how these are, we are doing combination therapy studies already. Yes. yes, scientifically, I think it makes a lot of sense to have combination studies, and I would like to see them in terms of uh, it, putting them, eventually translating them into clinical practice, uh, provided that there would be positive results. I think costs would also be a concern. Uh, mm -hmm. If if the drugs remain at high cost as they are, I think it's a concern to combine drugs unless the added value is really high because we 
treat more patients with the same resources. Uh, and and but I, I agree we should start from science and then from there evolve. But I, I, I think it's good to keep that in mind. Yeah. Also, uh we have learned about the bispecific bi antibody, such as anti-TNA plus anti-R7TA, right? So once bispecific antibodies with examined rheumatoid arthritis, no additional merits was observed, right? But we have to think about another combination of cytokine blocking. Yep. Yep. Okay, so thank you for your hard discussion. And we have discussed about a lot for uparacetam. And fortunately, uparacetam has a various indications with different dosing regimens. So we may learn a lot of those trials. So including thoracic arthritis or actual spongy arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis and atopic dermatitis or some other inflammatory bowel diseases. So it may be very interesting for future discussion. Thank you for joining us for this actual spongy arthritis podcast brought to you by the CSF. We really hope you found it useful. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to our channels on YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast from, so that you don't miss any future episodes. If you want to read more about what we discussed today, head over to signalin.com where you find summary slides of both of the papers. See you next time.